I'm joined today by Kathy Lenhart of PJ Solomon. Kathy, welcome. Thank you for having me. And Jason Russell. Jason, hello. Thank you for having me. Kathy, I want to start with you and ask you if you could just give me in a general sense what changes you've seen among retail supply chains as a result of the coronavirus pandemic. What's happening to retailers and how are their supply chains adjusting to this situation? Well, you know, I think going into this crisis, supply chain and distribution technology was a priority of, of major retailers. And, and Jason, you know, lives this day to day, but, you know, I cover the retail sector. I'm a banker that advises you know, retailers, omni-channel retailers, direct to consumer retailers. And I will tell you, this had risen to the top of their priority list. And I think what's happened now is, um, you know, if, if you think about what's happened in the advent of COVID, it's really changed consumers' shopping behavior. And I think what we're seeing is both what's happening now and what's going to be a permanent change, which is this stair step in migration to online. So that's, it's really necessitated that consumers shop differently. And I think the ability to meet uh, demand during this period has become ever more critical. And, you know, Jason looks at all the technologies that underpin how retailers being, bring product to the consumers. And what we're going to see is this has shined a light on supply chain deficiencies of these companies. It, if they had it already, now it's even more apparent. And what we're going to see, and this is what Jason will talk about to a, to a greater degree, is that companies are going to invest in the technologies that help them seamlessly deliver, you know, omni-channel ordering in its phone, it's, it's in home, it's in store, it's on the iPad, it's through apps, and, and then how the product is received from curbside pickup and, you know, Instacart, uh, their volume is off the chart. So having technology that supports all these capabilities is more important than ever before because everything has changed. Jason, could you speak to some of those specific technologies that uh, Kathy might be referring to? Yeah, no problem. I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a very good point. Um, you know, the way we kind of think about this evolution and where technology will come into play is there's this idea around, you know, on the channel you know, ordering. So either online, in person, or in phone. Uh, with on the channel ordering, the, you, know, you have to connect that to the fulfillment and the extra distribution of goods. So where do I receive my, do I receive my goods and when do I pick them up uh, and how are they delivered? So I think that you know, this is it's gonna spark a change in the, um, you know, the order, order fulfillment side of the equation. I think there's no way to actually solve it unless you have this combination of you know, technology uh, which is, you know, the fact is there's a lot of paper-based systems in the world still, um, uh, and those paper-based systems have to be digitized. Uh, so that's the first step. And then the second thing is you have to connect the network uh, to ever more sources to make sure you're sure you can use that technology. So, you know, what we, we've done is we've really taken a look at that from a framework perspective as we think about how do you maximize both order fulfillment flexibility along with the actual order on the channel environment. Uh, we've identified really four themes, um, you know, at a macro level that we think any supply chain strategy, strategy will have to include. Uh, that's that's fulfillment flexibility, sourcing flexibility, visi you know, visibility, and network. Uh, so we're happy to dig into any one of those um, that you'd like. Well, let's see if we can't take those very quickly one at a time because each of them sounds great, but each of them has its uh, attendant challenges to go with it as well. Starting with fulfillment flexibility, how and there, I would think that options are limited these days. How would companies actually make their fulfillment operations more flexible? Who'd, who'd like to address that? Yeah, Kathy, do you want to speak to just the actual, um, uh, the uh, where people want to pick up the goods environment? Yeah, no, the best retailers are going to have to be dynamic in this market where the consumer now demands versatility. And you know, this this is same day home delivery, convenience pickup, curbside in store, and and what Jason is talking about is the underpinning technologies that that give you that capability. If you don't know where your inventory is, how can a customer online order online and pick it up where they want to pick it up? And that's a fundamental issue in my view. And 
you know, it's really how you, and now in the, in the advent of COVID, COVID, it's, it's how do you engineer contactless pickup? Right. And that's sort of the new dimension that's going to, because we've seen a lot of retailers invest heavily towards this capability going into this. I mean, companies like Best Buy, I'm, I'm sorry, Best Buy, like Sally Beauty, where they've invested um, to have that curbside pickup and it's going to serve them well. But most retailers, a lot of retailers don't have it. Yeah. Jason, do you have a comment on that about the uh, yeah, film I, I side? Do. Yeah, it's interesting because, it, you know, I'm an industrial engineer and, it's, it, and as fulfillment options expand, so does complexity. And as you know, being a supply chain person yourself, um, you know, it's not always just about kind of, you know, are the goods there on the shelf? Can I pick them up? It's this balance of, you know, how do you sort of create a channel that has, you know, transportation flexibility, has inventory cost flexibility, has IT flexibility in an environment that's not simple uh, and it's inherently complex. So I think, you know, from a technology perspective, the only way to solve this equation, the only way to, to plan for, uh, you know, holidays as an example, uh, in arranging for curbside pickup during a holiday uh, is to use technology. So supply chain planning, as an example, would be a perfect use case, dynamic planning, to factor in how do we get the inventory in the right spot, how do you get the workers in the right spot, to deliver goods in a way that the consumer you know, wants to receive those goods. Uh, so we're at the very early days of, I think, um, adjusting to this new norm you know, you've seen guys like, you know, uh, companies like Best Buy, as an example, do pretty well with this, uh, where they've arranged um, curbside pickup sort of well in advance of COVID, quite frankly, and sort of refined those processes. Not every company is there. Every company is trying to get there, but we're not quite there yet. And, uh, yeah. and therefore, I think coming out of COVID, it's going to be a big opportunity for, for those investment uh, for those investments. Yeah, I want to talk about sourcing flexibility as well, because a lot of companies, unfortunately, have locked themselves into limited or single sourcing situations and paid a pretty bad price, not just in this situation, but in a number of disruptions that we've seen over the last decade or so. How can they broaden their sourcing universe and still stay efficient and still find reliable suppliers and still meet their customers' needs? Kathy, maybe you start on that one? Yeah, you know, it's interesting, as we saw the, um, the tariffs change behavior for brands and product makers, you know, they were able to, it's really surprising how they shifted supply chain out of China to avoid tariffs and really diversified that. Now, interestingly, that has come back to hurt folks because China is one of the fewer the countries where the supply chain is more open than in other parts of the world. But, you know, this is about looking country by country and where does your supply chain come from? Where does the product come from? And, and having an alternative source of supply, you know, and, and listen, it's really specific to what products you're carrying. But, you know, I think what we've seen is more agility on that. But, you know, Jason's going to talk about it more from, you know, a technical perspective and how the goods flow, but mm -hmm. from, you know, where they're coming from, I actually think, you know, you're going to see another change of diversification from where goods come from coming out of COVID. Yeah, and Jason, that also ties in with visibility too. I would think those things go hand in hand. So what would be your, your take on, on this particular uh, sourcing issue? Yeah, I think that, you know, with sourcing, it's interesting because, you know, with, with, there's obviously a natural a transition to being more localized as a result of sort of COVID. Um, you know, there is, you know, you have to have the supply, you know, supply chains are very long by nature, um, to deal with a, a flexible dynamic order environment, you're going to need to have a, a more of a localized, localized fulfillment options. Um, so I think number one, you're going to see some localization, um, of the supply chain, uh, which enables easier purchasing, easier planning, a uh, more real time delivery. Uh, I think number two, from a technological perspective, is you see this a lot around the dropship world, as an example. I was actually just reading uh, Amazon and their their recent earnings, and they're in a, they're seeing a lot more you know direct ship from vendor to customer activity. Uh, that's sourcing. That's sourcing and it's distribution. Um, the more that you can you can uh, 
you can connect your orders to from a supply base perspective, the more, the more flexibility you have to source from different parties. The underlying enabler there is you have to have systems that talk to each other. So I think from a technological perspective, you're going to see investments around network technologies, B2B, collaboration networks, um, uh, things that we've talked a lot about in the past, but this is going to put a really big uh, urgency around connecting the supply base to the actual so the buyers themselves. So in other words, we're talking not just about short-term solutions for companies just trying to survive this particular crisis, but some permanent changes down the line that might change supply chains, might create what everyone's now talking about and calling the new normal, right? So this is, this is going forward for pretty permanent stuff, right? Kathy, you have a kind of a, a perception on that? I agree. Um, you know, I think there's no, it's no accident that one of the few retail transactions that was done going into COVID was Costco's acquisition of a technology uh, enabling that, you know, I, so I think that is a, a, you know, a forerunner of things to come in terms of how they invest and whether it's M&A or just investing in technology. But you know, what we're seeing is that the bigger retailers in particular are going to, they're strong, they're going to come out of this, but they're going to try to be more agile because I think this has, again, shined a light on where their own systems are deficient and they've invested yeah. heavily already, but I think you'll see more investment. Well, those are some excellent insights from PJ Solomon. I want to thank you both, Kathy Lenhart and Jason Russell, for talking to us today about some changes that companies need to be making and will be making in the future as a result of this crisis. Thanks, guys, for being with us today. Really appreciate it. Thank you for having us.